Yeah, I'm glad to be back. Okay, so like I said, during this series, we are going to study one of the most difficult sections of the book of Revelation. We're going to take a look at the seven trumpets, right? Now, but before we get into the study, let us look at the topics that we will be studying in this series, right? So let's just go give that a quick uh, glance through. First is the introductory uh, matters. Uh, that is the different views in the Seventh day Adventist Church. You'd be amazed that we do have different views in our church also and in the Christian world uh, on the seven trumpets. What principles do they use for interpreting the trumpet? Then we have the first trumpet, the second trumpet, third trumpet, fourth trumpet, fifth trumpet. And then we will study the chart from Revelation 12 to 22. Then we have um, Revelation 11, there's an interlude on the 126 years and the French Revolution. Now we have this interlude in uh, the chapter 11. It covers two particular periods of history. The first period in the interlude of Revelation 11 deals with the 1260 years of papal dominion and the 1,260 years in which the papacy or the little horn, the beast of Revelation chapter 13 ruled. So it, it ruled primarily over Europe. And then the second event that we find in this interlude is a description or depiction of the French Revolution, right? French Revolution plays an important part in, uh, in the trumpets. Uh, then, uh, uh, we find that this interlude amplifies the fourth trumpet and the fifth trumpet, right? Remember that the interlude in Revelation 11 is going to amplify the fourth trumpet, which would be the 1260 years and the fifth trumpet, which is the French Revolution, right? Then um, the eighth study is going to be on Matthew, Luke and the times of the Gentiles. Now this study deals with the time of the Gentiles spoken of in Revelation 11, and also in Matthew 24 and Luke chapter 21, which is the synopsis, the, 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 the same event in, the, in that gospel, right? So we are going to look at it. What is the time of the Gentiles? Who are the time of the Gentiles? We will study that. Then we have the little sealed book, the mighty angel from heaven, measure the temp uh, temple of God, then Daniel 10 and the little book. Then once again, we will look at the flow of Revelation 8, 12 to 15, 4 in chart form. So we understand that. Now the studies are 9 through 12. Uh, we are going to deal with the little book of Daniel 12, 24, uh, which, uh, you know, the, the Daniel was told to seal the book till the end of time. So this, this um, eight, nine to 12, the studies nine to 12 are going to uh, amplify that, right? So it's, um, so we will study this. Uh, this is a study of the second interlude that we find after the fifth trumpet. And that, that interlude deals with the little book that was open in Revelation chapter 10. Then we will study the sixth trumpet and we're going to deal with the sixth trumpet it's going to take us quite a while to study the sixth trumpet. If you have studied Revelation before, you know that we are right now in the sixth trumpet, right? Then the seventh trumpet. Then we will study the marriage, the marriage supper and possessing of the kingdom. What that means, uh, we will, in the 16th study, we will examine the subjects of the kingdom. Uh, then 17 matters relating to the literary structure, very important. You cannot read Revelation from chapter one to the end and understand it. Revelation has a very intricate uh, literary stru structure. And then uh, the views and issues 
uh, in the study of the trumpets, that is the proph prophecy of Josiah Litch and the seven trumpets in Adventism that the Bible, uh, Bible research, Adventist Bible research came up with, right? So from chapters 15 to 18 are some additional points, right? Uh, the title to the marriage, the marriage supper process in the kingdom, looking at the marriage customs in scripture so that we can understand what it means to, uh, what it means the marriage supper of the lamb. Uh, we are going to see that the marriage of Jesus is the same thing as Jesus taking over the kingdom. Uh, then we, we notice that in the next chapter, the next chapter deals with examine the subject uh, of the kingdom. It has to do with the investigative judgment. Then you have matters, like I said, relating to the books of uh, Revelation, chapters 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, and how they're organized. And finally, chapter 18, reviews and issues in the study of the trumpets. And then you have, uh, and, ha and have there concluded the prophecy of Joshua Lich and the seven trumpets of it. So that is what we are going to study uh, over 18, 18 weeks. Okay, so now let's begin our study of the seven trumpets of Revelation. Uh, do you know that there are four general views on the trumpets among the Christian ex exposition, expositors, right? You get the preterist, the futurist, the dual fulfillment, and the historicist, right? Now, this is not only the views of Adventists, but also the views of non-Adventists. Now, we are going to take each, each of these uh, sections, and we're going to um, sub analyze it a little bit further. So let's begin with the first one. It is the preterist view. Let's read the, um, the description that is put up there. Preterist. The trumpets depict events relating to the Roman Empire and the Jewish nation in the first centuries of the Christian era. The trumpets are thus simple history and therefore they are of historical interest, but have, a, but have no relevance for the church today. Okay, so basically the pet preterist view uh, is the trumpets were fulfilled in ancient Roman Empire and they were fulfilled with literal the Jewish nation in the first years of the history of the Christian church. So if that's the case, then they have no interest of his, but, but of historical study, right? So they have absolutely no relevance for the church today. That is their view, right? Why? Because they have already passed and they don't depict events that are going to take place in the future or that are taking place now. So that is their view. Then you have the future. Now let's look at this. This is another view uh, that is presented in the world today. Uh, and basically, this view teaches that. Let's read that and see what what they what their school of thought is. The seven trumpets de depict scourges that will afflict human after the rapture of the church. Therefore, the trumpets have no relevance for believers in the church today because when the seven trumpets blow their trumpets, the church will be gone. Mm. <laughs> yes, now this is their view, right? <laughs> now, this, primarily, <laughs> if you're outside the Seventh day Adventist church, I don't think anyone within the Adventist church teaches that the trumpets fall, uh, fall or happen after the rapture of the church because they don't believe in a rapture, right? So I don't think Adventists, there are any Adventists who believe in the secret rapture. So basically, these trumpets are describing events. They say, that this is their thought, right? Their school of thought, uh, that these events are going to take place after the church is raptured to heaven, right? And then you get a seven years, now they think then God is going to, uh, they're going, God is going to, uh, the, their view is God is going to take the, um, the, the Christians to heaven, and then he gives seven years to the Jews to get that together and take them. That is how they think, right? So basically, uh, these trumpets are describing events that are going to take place after the church is raptured to heaven, right? Terrible judgments that God is going to afflict humanity with, which means that the seven trumpets have no real effect for the church because the church is going to be gone. And if the church is going to be gone in the rapture, why should we even study the trumpets? They don't have any relevance to it, right? So we had the 
retrorists, they believe that it happened in the past, so why bother about it today? Then we have the futurist, it's going to be after the rapture, so why get bothered about it? Then we have, interestingly, uh, we have the dual facing one. Let's read that and see what that talks about. Prophecy has a dual fulfillment. Among Adventists, there are those who believe the trumpets have a dual fulfillment, one in the past throughout the history of the Christian church and the other in the future. Okay, so now that is affecting our church, right? So here we have another view, which is the dual fulfillment. You have some Adventists in this camp. Basically, this is the idea that the trumpets have a Two, two fulfillments, dual fulfillments. So yes, you can apply the historicist method, the flow of history, and it says that it has fulfilled in the past, but they will, uh, but these trumpets will have a literal, now they're talking about it, a literal fulfillment in the future. Now, some Adventists say that the future fulfillment of the trumpet is going to take place uh, before the close of probation in the future. For us, it's still the future, right? So that is the second, third school of thought. Then we have the historicity. Let's read that then. The introductory vision to the trumpets describes the starting and ending points of the series. The starting point is the day of Pentecost, and Jesus began his intercession at the golden altar of incense in the holy place. The series ends when Jesus throws down the censer, ceases to intercede and takes over the kingdoms of the world. Strict historic, historicists do not believe that the trumpets have a dual fulfillment. So remember the, the holy place of the sanctuary had three uh, articles of furniture. One was the table of showbread, one was the altar of incense and the other was the candlesticks right the candlesticks was the churches uh the showbread was the seal we, we found and this is the trumpets the trumpets are the uh, the altar of incense so now this is i believe is the correct one the historic historic interpretation of the trumpets basically what this view teaches is that the intra introduct revision of the trumpets described like I read the starting and ending points of the series. So if the starting point was at the day of Pentecost, when Jesus began his intercession for the human race at the golden altar of incense in heaven in the holy place, and the series of the trumpets will end when Jesus throws down his scepter, seizing intercession for mankind and will take over the kingdoms of the world. So strict historicists, do not believe that the trumpets have a dual fulfillment. And this uh, is actually the, um, the hermeneutics of the Adventist church, right? Of the church at large. Now the historicist principle. Now, now let me very be, be very clear. This study that we are going to do is a study that is a result of Pastor Bo's personal study, right? From scripture, he has studied scripture. Then he has uh, uh, used spirit of prophecy. Uh, he doesn't use Uriah Smith because Uriah Smith uh, trumpet explanation is a bit not all right there, right? Now there's nothing wrong with Uriah Smith, uh, but his, his exposition on the trumpets is not biblical or uh, doesn't match with Bibli uh, the Bible and spirit of prophecy. But then Pastor Bo has. Um, Actually, he, he used a good lexicon, he says, with the concordance and studied the trumpets. And that when he did that, he found that the trumpets made perfect sense in light of uh, scripture and spirit of prophecy. So this study is based on his study of that, right? Now, so all the passages in the book of Revelation, of all the passages in the book of Revelation, the seven trumpet series is the most difficult to understand. Now, why is that? Um, if you look at them through the prism of Uriah Smith, I don't know whether anyone of us here have read Uriah Smith's exposition on the trumpets, possibly Angel must have done it. Uh, 
if you if you look at it through the interpretation of Uriah Smith, uh, who gave the, the, the gave an interpretation, it makes very little sense. Uriah Smith um, begins the trumpets with the barbarians, right? We are we'll go into that a little later. Now there are several interpretive principles that we must remember when we study the Book of Revelation, right? The first where. Uh, First, when uh, the book of when when we are studying the book of Revelation, we find that Revelation does not interpret its own symbol, right? So we must allow the entire Bible to explain their meaning. Now we have done that. We have studied that in our series on the, the churches and the seals. So that should, that is not something new. But we we find that when you are talking about the trumpets, you, the Revelation doesn't explain the symbols. You have to go to the rest of the Bible. So we have to go to uh, other places in scripture to discover the correct interpretation of a particular symbol. The second is, now this is possibly the most important principle, we must carefully consider the order of events or the literary, literary structure of the book, right? The book of Revelation is intricately, it's an intricately woven book with flashbacks, it takes us forward four days, then it repeats and expands. There's a repetition and expansion. So we must re remember that God did not reveal the book of Revelation to John in strict chronological order. The visions of Revelation run in repetitive cycles. Remember that, right? So just like the book of Daniel has four cycles, Daniel 7, Daniel 8 and 9, and Daniel 10 through 11, in other words, the book of Revelation, you can't say, well, I'm going to um, find out uh, what's going to happen in the future. So you start reading Revelation uh, chapter one, verses one, and you go through Revelation um, up to Revelation 22 last, uh, to the last verse, and you say, okay, now I know the chronological sequence of events. No, you will be more confused than you began because Revelation runs in repetitive cycles, and Revelation has a very intricate structure, literary structure. Now, how, for an example, there are three passages that mention the 144,000, right? The last um, group group that is going to live on this earth before Jesus comes. And it, and each section has a different emphasis. I think we did this based uh, in, in the, our series on the um, seals, but we find that Revelation 7, 1 to 8, it's talking about the sealing of the 144,000, right? Then in Revelation 14, 1 to 5, you, you have John explaining the character of the 144,000. Then in uh, Revelation 15, 2 to 4, you have the victory of the 144,000 over the beast, his mark, and his number. So the 144,000, there is this cycles that it takes to explain to us who the 144,000 are. So obviously it is not in chronological order. You simply have different, three different passages that emphasize different aspects of the 144,000. Now the third principle is that the introductory themes to each series of each series contains the beginning ending point of the entire series. Now this was something that blew my mind because we read that verse, but we don't quite understand it, right? Now we will explain it a little further. Uh, we'll unpack that in a bit. Uh, so in other words, the introductory verse to each of the series, right? The churches, the series on the seals that we just finished, and the series on the trumpets contains its starting point when the series started and the, um, the, the uh, and the ending point of the entire series. So that particular one verse of, of, of the, the, the verse explain to us the beginning of the um, the series and the ending of the series in that one section, right? So I think we discussed this before, uh, but let's look at several points so that we can understand this principle a little better, right? Now, Revelation chapter one, verses one to seven, there are two points of time, right? Uh, Revelation 1, 1 to 7, you get the introduction to the seven churches. And in that, in those same verses, you have the mention of the second coming. So introduction to the seven churches will be um, the, the 
Okay, let's go to Revelation 7 so we can see this. Uh, you will see we begin at point four, uh, at verse four, so that we understand it better. So let's read this. Where the, where, remember, this is the introduction to the churches. And here we find the beginning to the series and the end to the series. Let's read it and then try to figure out what the beginning is and what the end is. John to the seven churches, which are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him. Even they who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Okay, so now John to the seven churches, um, which are in Asia, as, um, so that would be the beginning, right? So now John is writing to the seven churches. Remember in our series, uh, so the seven churches are in Asia, but notice then the last verse, the sub, verse seven, I have uh, highlighted it, I have in bold. It says, it, um, behold, he's coming in the clouds and every eye shall see him. Even they who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. So now let me ask you, is verse seven in chronological order to the verse, verses before? Uh, with which we find uh, before, right? It says now John to the seven churches and all of a sudden in verse seven, it says, it talks about the second coming. So it's not in chronological order, right? It jumps to the end now because um, uh, after, after, spe after speaking about the churches afterwards, it goes after speaking about that Jesus come in the clouds of glory, we find that it goes back to talk about the churches, right? So here, this is the introduction to the, to the seven churches. And you have the beginning point is with John writing to the seven churches. And the seven churches end at the point when Jesus comes in the clouds, right? So is that clear? So the first introductory verses or verse of uh, the uh, series, the churches, the seals, the trumpet, gives us the beginning point and the end, up, end point of that series. Now let's go to... Um, uh, okay, Revelation 3 1, right? Uh, 3 1, it tells us. Um, let's notice 3 1. This is the conclusion to the church series, right? And this conclusion is also introducing the seals, right? Revelation 3 concludes the churches, but it, it introduces the seven churches. So, notice clearly here we have once again. Two points, right? When Jesus sat on the throne, in, it was in the past. And when the redeemed will sit with Jesus, which is the future. So let's read Revelation 3.21. So we catch a glimpse of this, um, uh, this uh, introductory um, verses of the series. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. So have we overcome and are we sitting with him now? No, that is future, right? But did Jesus overcome and did he, did he sit with his father? Yes. So that is past, right? So what is the starting point of the seal? When Jesus sits with his father on his throne at his ascension. That became the, the, the starting point for the seal, right? And where do the seals end? Like we found out in our study. We find that when Jesus sits with us in heaven uh, in uh, after the second time, right? We found that we had the uh, you had the millennium judgment, and then the uh, the earth is um, destroyed and made new, and then we sit with him on his throne. So Revelation three one gives us the end of the churches and the beginning of the seals, right? So. I hope you're catching the picture here that the introductory verse gives you the beginning and the 
ending point, right? So the beginning of the, uh, the series was in the apostolic church when Jesus rose at Pentecost, and it, it ended when we, his church, the saved, will sit with him in the new earth, right? Now then let's go to Revelation 8, 22. Uh, here, Jesus is offici uh, officiating with the censor, and uh, when probation closes, he casts it down. So this is going to be the beginning of the trumpets, which we are going to start. So let's read Reve uh, Revelation 8, 2 to 5. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Okay. Now the smoke of the incense with prayers of the saints ascended to God from the angel's hand. When did that work begin? Mingling with the incense when Jesus at Pentecost began his intercessory work on behalf of mankind in the holy place, right? In the heavenly sanctuary. Now notice there's a change of scene later on in verse five, where it says, and then the angel took the censer filled with fire from the altar. Now, what does he do with the censer? The, he, he cast the censer to the earth. The censer represents the prayers mingled with the um, righteousness of Jesus um, presented to the father for answers. So if the censer is thrown down to earth, what does that? Uh, what is that event? That is the close of probation when intercession for mankind will cease, right? And then he, he, we find the thunderings and the lightnings and the earthquakes, which represent the end of intercession. So that represents the end of uh, um, probation. Probation closes. So we have Jesus in the on the day of Pentecost. He enters. And he begins his intercession. He begins his mediatory work for us. And then it ends when probation closes. So that is the beginning and the end of the uh, trumpets, right? So we will study this a little bit later in more detail. Uh, we will, uh, when we deal with uh, Ezekiel chapter 10, where it speaks about taking the censer and throwing it in Jerusalem, which means Jerusalem is going to be punished, right? So we find that if you go to Revelation 15, as soon as the censer is thrown out, the smoke fills the most holy place. No one can enter it. And then the plague angels come, right? So we will discuss that uh, a little bit more in detail next time. So this point is very critical. It's very important to understand the introductory vision, which because it gives you the beginning or starting point uh, of the series, and it gives you the end point of the series, right? Now let's go to Revelation 14, 15 to 19. Uh, this contains the conclusion to the trumpets, right? A summary and a summary of the rest of the book of uh, Revelation. And it introduces the next section to the book of Revelation, which is Revelation 12 to 14. Very interesting. We may have read this before, but we wouldn't have understood it like this. So let's read the Conclusion uh, verses of, Revelation, uh, of the seven trumpets in Revelation 11, 15, and 17. And the seventh angel sounded. It's my, uh, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders, which sat before God on their seats, fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and are to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. Okay, so that is talking about the 
end of the um, trumpet series and it's giving, giving us a summary of the rest of the book of Revelation, right? Now, Revelation 11, 18, right? Now, Revelation 11, 18, some people make the mistake of thinking that Revelation 11, 18 follows what is in the previous verses that we just read, Revelation 15 to 17. But that is not the case. We are going to see what happens in Revelation verse 18, uh, uh, 11 verse 18. Now is going to give you the summary of the rest of the book. So we find 15 verses 15 and 17 ending the uh, trumpet series. And then verse 18 gives us a summary of what the rest of the book of Revelation. Let's read that um, uh, verse, verse 18. The nations were angry and your wrath has come and the time of the dead that they should be judged and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Now, that is the summary of the rest of the book. We are going to find that out, right? Um, but how do we know uh, that uh, this is the summary? Let's read this very interesting statement from uh, Mrs. White. Uh, see, Mrs. White, the little old lady, understood how, right? Understood this very clearly. That is why you need, uh, God gave us the spirit of prophecy. That's why Revelation uh, 10 tells us they had the prophet in their midst, right? So that we could understand this. How did she understand this? It was the lucky guess, right? She was inspired because the same spirit that inspired the Bible inspired me this right. Mrs. White as well, right? So we're going to um, see detail after detail in the trumpet. The Mrs. White is right on target in her interpretation. So let's read this statement that we find in early writings, um, page 36. Now this is this takes you back, right? Right? Let's read and see. Let's see what she has to say about that. Then I saw that Jesus would not leave the most holy place until every case was decided either for salvation or destruction and that the wrath of God could not come until Jesus had finished his work in the most holy place, laid off his priestly attire and clothed himself with the garments of vengeance. Then Jesus will step out, of, uh, step out from between the father and man and God will keep silence no longer but pour out his wrath on those who have rejected his truth. I saw that the anger of the nations, the wrath of God and the time to judge the dead were separate and distinct, one following the other. Also that Michael had not stood up and that the time of trouble such as never was had not yet commenced. The nations are now getting angry. But when our high priest has finished his work in the sanctuary, he will stand up, put on the garments of vengeance, and then the seven last plagues will be poured out, the wrath of God. Okay, so what is the wrath of God? The wrath of God is the seven last plagues, which are a God's wrath unmingled with mercy, right? We have studied that before. But then he lays off his priestly attire and he clothes himself with garments of vengeance. That is talking about the close of probation, right? Then the nations are getting angry. Um, now this is taking place, uh, is that taking place before or after probation? Before, isn't it? Well, do you find the expression nations are getting angry? Uh, you know, the nations getting angry. We, we, we will um, unpack that a little more. Now, Mrs. White is not describing just nations are getting angry at each other. The nations are getting angry ultimately. They'll be angry against who? With whom? God's people. And by the way, that phrase nations are getting angry is described in Revelation chapter 12 through chapter 14. That's where the anger of the nations are described in the rest of the books of Revelation, right? So let's go to um, a summary of the five chronological states in Revelation 11, 18 that we just read. Uh, so we find Revelation chapters 12 to 14 is talking about the nations were angry, right? It describes, um, you find a description here of the powers of the earth 
angry at God's people and wanting to destroy God's people. So Revelation chapter 12 to 14 uh, give us an expansion of the nations were angry. Then Revelation 15 to 19, chapter 15 to 19, your wrath has come, describes the close of probation in the seven last plagues uh, that summarizes the phrase, your wrath has come, right? So the seven last plagues describe the wrath of God that is unmingled with, without, unmingled with mercy, right? Right now, we still have God's mercy on us. Then it will be without mercy. Then we find Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 11, the time to judge the dead, right? Uh, now, this event um, is the time to judge the dead. Do the righteous know who is judged after the plagues are poured out when Jesus comes? So this is describing the millennium judgment that the, the righteous, hopefully you and me, will be a part of. Then we have Revelation 19 verses 11 through 21 and um, 22, 12, the time to reward your saints, right? Uh, this is uh, when Jesus comes, he is going to reward his saints, isn't he? He's going to begin um, the judgment of the wicked and he's going to reward his saints because all the judgments that these earthly courts gave the wrong judgments are going to be reversed in that judgment. We studied that right in our series on the seal. Then Revelation 20, 14 and 15, destroy those who destroy the earth. So then you find the final destruction of those who destroy the earth when, uh, when they are going to be destroyed after the beginning, right? So we have in this one verse 18, it gives us a full introduction, a summary of the rest of the books after the, after the end of the trumpet series, right? Now, Revelation uh, eleven nineteen introduces, it's the introduction to chapters 12 and 14, right? Someone likes to read that? Okay, it says, then the temple of God was opened in heaven and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple and there were lightnings, noises, thunderings and earthquake and great hair, right? Now, Mrs. White always applies Revelation 11, 9 uh, to the beginning of the work of Jesus in the most holy place in 1844. So that is an introduction to Revelation 12 to 14, the next section, right? Uh, but so if you and I, you know, just take Revelation in chronological order, then you would have to say that the opening in, of the temple in heaven and the Ark of the Testament is seen. You would have to say that that comes after the second coming of Jesus, right? So, but Revelation 11, 19 is doing is John is taking us back to the section that deals with the anger of the nation, right? So John explains in verse 18, he gives us a summary. Then he takes us back to the section, Revelation 12, 14, immediately after he takes us to the section that is speaking about the nations and angry, and then he will explain that. So is that clear? So Revelation, it's, it's not easy to read Revelation from one to two and understand it because it has um, lots of little uh, structural um, things. It goes in cycles, it takes you forward, it takes you backwards. So you need to know where it's going forward, where it's going backwards, where it's uh, repeating and where it's amplifying what it said before, right? Now there are serious questions on the hermeneutical consistency. Now her hermeneutical means principles of interpretation, right? In interpreters of the book of Revelation, we find are sometimes frequently inconsistent in the inconsistent in the way uh, they in which they interpret the book. For example, the historicist method teaches 
that the churches, the seals, begin in the apostolic time, right? You and I studied that. It was very clear. We found it out in the Bible, from the Bible and spirit of prophecy. And that series ends with the setting up of Christ's kingdom, right? So this being the case, why do interpreters begin? Now, this is the case. The churches and the trumpets begin in the apostolic time, right? The first church of uh, Ephesus. But why do interpreters begin the trumpet series with the barbarian invasions and the fall of the Roman Empire in the fourth century, right? So we have this confusion. Now, Ephesus is the apostolic church, right? And um, in the seals, uh, we teach that we studied that the white horse in the church, remember, it goes out conquering and to conquer, right? That that was the apostolic church. So the series began um, in apostolic time. And then we, as we studied the series, it took us to the end when Jesus sets up his everlasting kingdom. Now, this being the case, we find that Uriah Smith, one of the founders of our church, the old forefathers of our church, right? And other interpreters say that the trumpets begin in the fourth century with the barbarian invasion, right? So there is this inconsistency. The second, uh, some Adventist interpreters, like I said before, believe that there is a dual fulfillment of the trumpets, one past and the other future, right? However, is there such a thing as a dual fulfillment in chain prophecies? No, Daniel 2 is a chain prophecy. Daniel 2 flowed historically. It doesn't have a second fulfillment. It flows, right? We are now in the close, right? Uh, so you cannot have Babylon beginning again, right? So do the churches and the seals also have dual fulfillment? No, right? So Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, and 9, and Daniel 11, they don't have dual fulfillment. They flow with history, right? So these are chain prophecies, and they have only one fulfillment, right? Now, this is, a, this, this is something that we who are doing deep study need to understand, right? Chain prophecies have only one fulfillment and they, are, they move historically, right? They move with history. Now, another question is, um, were the barbarian invasions of such historical importance that John needed four trumpets to describe them, right? Uh, were, 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 uh, were, okay, so now those who interpret the trumpet as a depiction of the barbarian invasion. Now, those of you who may have studied Revelation before will we'll understand this because they, the, the, um, the trumpets, they talk about the trumpets as the barbarian invasion, invasions, right? They talk about uh, Islam, they talk about Turkey. Right, so we are going to find out the hermeneutical consistency that that is not consistent with scripture and the Bible, right? So um, the, the invasions and the growth of Islam and Turkey are many times inconsistent in the manner, uh, they are inconsistent in the manner that they interpret the symbol, right? That is why we at the beginning said Revelation doesn't uh, interpreted symbols, you have to go to the rest of the Bible to get interpretation, remember? So sometimes they take the language literally, sometimes they take the language of revelation symbolic, symbolically. However, we must apply the same principle to the trumpets as we do to the rest of the book. The trumpets, you cannot take the trumpets and interpret them differently. So finally, uh, those uh, those who see the rise and fall of Islam and the role of Turkey in the trumpets must ask where where in other prophetic lines of prophecy chain prophecies do we find the mention of Turkey and Muslim do are they in Daniel two no Turkey and Islam are not in Daniel 2, not even mentioned uh, in scripture or spirit of prophecy. Daniel 7, they're not there. Daniel 8 and 9, not there. Daniel 11 to 12, they're not there, right? 
Then let's move to Revelation. In the series of the churches, they are not mentioned. In the series of the seals, they are not mentioned. Revelation 12, there is no mention of them there. And Revelation 13, there is no mention of them there. So to insert Muslims and Turkey into the trumpets, simply as a reflection of a view that was held by Uriah Smith, who introduced this view into the Adventist church. Now we are not demeaning uh, Uriah Smith. His commentaries on Daniel and Revelation are good, but we find that he didn't have all the light on the trumpet, right? So each one had light given to them um, as, as they studied and Uriah Smith didn't have all the light on the trumpet. Now I'm saying that because I've studied the trumpet before and it has confused me much, right? Because of this Islam and Turk story. Now he, um, uh, he uh, Uriah Smith didn't have light particularly on the Battle of Armageddon. He believed that uh, the king of the north is Turkey and the drying of the Euphrates River is literal. It, it doesn't mean that everything that he wrote was untrustworthy, right? Which is why I recommended his books to, to be read. So we are just mentioning that he, there were difficulties uh, that we have in his particular interpretation, especially of the trumpet. So the Adventist main hermeneutical uh, consistency that we use is scripture that the trumpets also flow historically, right? There's a historicist movement of the trumpet, right? Now, let's move to the trumpets. Let's go to the introduction. We are beginning, uh, as we begin, we need to ask a very important question. Now, are we understanding that the trumpets are not from a futurist uh, point of view, but it is from a historical perspective, right? Now, Adventist theology has traditionally interpreted the churches, the seals, and the trumpets from a historicist perspective. However, in recent times, right, there has been a tendency among some Adventist writers to interpret the trumpets from a futurist perspective, right? No one has done more to popularize this new view of the trumpets than Marvin Moore, who for years was the editor of the Times of the Times, right? So he got it wrong. He went against the church's stand on how to interpret, right? We find that very much in our church today when people think that they know how, they go against the church's um, standard practice of interpreting hermeneuticals, of interpreting scripture, right? Now, as regards to the trumpet, there are two futuristic schools of thought, right? Within Adventism today, I'm telling you this because we might encounter that uh, in, in some of our conversation. It's conversation. So some schools see the fulfillment of trumpets as post-probationary time, right? The other school sees the fulfillment as future from our time, but occurring mostly before the close of probation. Right, those are the two uh, futuristic schools of thought. Marvin Moore be belongs to the second group, right? He thinks that it will happen before all seven trumpets, right? And as we see, there are serious problems with both these schools of futuristic thought, right? Now, uh, Pastor Bo goes on to say that he believes that the futuristic school commits two mistakes in their interpretation of the trumpets. First, they often literalize the symbolic language. They take it literally, right? They speak about meteors, meteorites falling from heaven, literally. They talk about asteroids falling on, uh, upon the earth. But when the Bible speaks about a falling star, we need to see how the Bible interprets a falling star, right? and not just think that it is a meteorite or an asteroid. We have to let the Bible interpret its own symbols. So first, they often take these symbols in literal language, right? Second, they fail to do a serious study of the intricate literary arrangement of the Book of Revelation. And as we see the literary structure of Revelation, is, so to speak, 
the skeleton that holds the entire book together. The literary structure holds the entire book of Revelation together. And if you don't get the skeleton, you have a jellyfish that moves here, there, and everywhere and confuses. Now, here's a many important point. Many scholars have concluded that the book of Revelation follows the sequential order of the Hebrew sanctuary. In the series on the seven churches, we saw as we studied, Jesus walks among the candlesticks, right? In the series on the seals, Jesus moves to the table of showbread, right? And in the series on the trumpets, we will find out that Jesus ministers at the altar of incense, right? And in Revelation 11, 19, we read, right? He moves into the most holy place from the altar. He moves into the most holy place in 1844 to where the Ark of the Covenant is, and he begins his ministry of judgment there, right? So it takes, it moves uh, according to the sequential order of the sanctuary. That is why when we studied the sanctuary, we, uh, we studied that, right? So actually Revelation begins in chapter one, if you, if you uh, read it carefully, with the sacrifice of Christ, with the death of Christ, he redeemed us through his blood. He was dead and yet he is alive, we are told in Revelation uh, chapter one. So it begins actually with his work on earth. Then you have the candlestick, right? Then you find the table of showbread, and then you have the altar of incense, and then you have the opening of the most holy place. So we have, we go from the courtyard, we go to the holy place, and then we move to the most holy place. Then in Revelation 15, 5 to 8, Jesus closes his sanctuary ministry. Uh, and, in the temp and then we find that the temple is filled with smoke, right? Now, this is the day of uh, when he sees us in suspicion, right? And we find that when the most holy place is filled with smoke, no one can enter it. We will study Revelation 15, right? Because the intercession of Christ has ended for the human race. So we will no longer have a intercessor because everyone on earth has chosen either to be on Christ's side or they are on the side of Satan, right? Now, after you have the description of the seven last plagues, that the plagues are, begin to fall in Revelation 16 through 90. And immediately after the fall of the seven last plagues, you get Revelation 20, which portrays the scapegoat ceremony. Now, this is but the end of the sanctuary, day of atonement ceremony, right? And then the destruction of the wicked, right? Finally, Revelation chapters 21 and 22 describe the new heavens, the new earth, where Jesus will live with the redeemed forever. So it take us, takes us through the sanctuary uh, sequence. So if you understand the Hebrew sanctuary, understanding Revelation is also becomes a bit more easier. So, uh, uh, the, ex, so if we extract the trumpets from their legitimate context and insert them into the future, we are destroying this beautiful sanctuary symmetry of the book, right? So we have to realize that the trumpets fit within a certain time period. And that time period is the intercession of Christ in the sanctuary, okay? Now let's move on to the next one. Now let's take a look at the normative seven day Adventist position on the trumpets. Now I'm explaining this before we go into it. So we clear any doubts that we may have had in previous studies, right? Now there are certain non-negotiables when it comes to Seventh-day Adventists, our concept of the seven trumpets, right? Now, I think many of us have heard of, may have heard of Desmond Ford. He died, I think in 2019 or 20. He, he was from Australia, Avondale. He was an extremely charismatic a preacher, but he confused Adventist theology because he came up with this odd, uh, novel idea on Bible prophecy, right? That was totally not biblical or spiritual prophecy authorized, right? So then the general conference, 
establish the Daniel and Revelation Study Committee. It's called the DACO, right? To look into his argument because they promote his credentials and the disfellowship him because he brought um, uh, theology that was contrary to uh, what we believe that is um, biblical, uh, not based on the Bible, right? He had different, <laughs> he had a totally different idea about it. And there were many who, who followed him in that thinking, right? So the result was in this study, the General Conference established this, this committee. And uh, the result was a publication of seven books on the various issues relating to the sanctuary Bible prophecy and re relating to the seven trumpets, right? Dacom gave the following explanation. Now, if any of you have the opportunity to get this seven part series, it will be excellent for us to uh, get it and read. Now, I haven't read it, but it, it, it answers every single objection that was raised by Desmond Ford, uh, and which, which is raised by evangelicals today regarding the seven trumpets, right? So Frank Holbrook was the editor of this uh, DACOM, and this is what the but the, the explanation, right? That they gave on uh, where we as a 20 stand on the historicist method. So let's read that. Today's Seventh-day Adventists virtually stand alone as exponents of the historic method. Since non-Catholic groups in general have abandoned this approach in favor of one of the two methods mentioned above, the Daniel and Revelation Committee wishes to reaffirm to the World Church the validity of the historic approach to these two apoc apocalyptic books. The committee sees it as the only sound method to use. Our pioneers did not follow cunningly devised fables when they searched and preached the truths of these prophecies. They have passed on to us a rich heritage. Beautiful, isn't it? So we stand, the Adventist church as um, stand on uh, interpreting his uh, prophecy is the historicist method, right? Any other method is not, uh, uh, it's non-negotiable, right? That is what I mean. It, it, you cannot have two methods. It's the historicist method. Now, while not providing a definitive interpretation of the trumpets, the DACOM did establish once again some non-negotiable parameters that must be followed in the study of the trumpets in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. They, 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 they reach three conclusions, and here they are. Let's read the first one. Revelation. The literary structure divides the book of Revelation into two major sections. One, a historical section that emphasizes the experience of the church and related events during the Christian era, and two, an eschatological, that is end time section that focuses particularly on end time events in the end of the world. Okay, so they, they came up with the first one. They say the structure, literally structure of the book of Revelation has two major sections. One is the historical section, Revelation 1 to 14, chapter 14, that ex emphasizes the experience of the church, right? So that will be the seals and the trumpet. Then it talks about the eschatological section, uh, which would be the series beginning um, from Revelation uh, chapter 12, where you have the introduction, to the persecution of the 1260 years, um, the dragon being enraged with the woman, chapter 13, the beast is image, and his mark, and Revelation chapter 14, the three angels' message, and then the end time events, which are um, uh, Revelation 15 to 22. So you get the plagues, the 
what happens then and the second new earth and the second come. The next is the series of the um, seals and the trumpets occur in the historical section of Revelation. Remember that gap. The series of the seals and trumpets occur in the historical section of Revelation. Consequently, we should seek for their fulfillment in the historical time, the Christian era, right? So these are the non-negotiables that they bring it, right? Uh, except for the very last three trumpets, which we will, when we study, we find they, they will be blown towards the end, right? Then the third one is the prophecies of the seals and the trumpets have only one property fulfilled, right? That's why the historic this method, it flows, history flows, so the first trumpet has been blown and finished. It's not going to be blow, blown again in another uh, in the future. Second has blown, third has blown, fourth has blown, fifth has blown, sixth is what we are in, right? So it has uh, only one prophetic fulfillment in the course of history. So I hope this is clear to us, right? Now let's move on to um, what Mrs. White says, the dangerous dangers of Futurism, thinking that you can take the trumpets and put them into the future. Now, Mrs. White warned about the dangers of extracting prophecies from their legitimate historical context and applying them to the future, right? She wrote, what we're going to read now is something she wrote to a school teacher by the name of John Bell. Actually, she wrote two long testimonies to him. Uh, we, we are going to read only a small portion of what she wrote to him today. Uh, why did she write to him? Because he was taking prophecies that apply to the past and he was applying it to the future. So he was taking them out of context, out of the legitimate historical context. And Mrs. White warned that we need to study each section of Revelation within the time period when it was fulfilled. So let's read the first um, First, uh, first testimony that she wrote to him. This is found in um, Selected Messages, page 102. There have been one and another who in studying their Bibles thought they discovered great light and new theories, but these have not been correct. The scripture is all true. However, by misapplying the scripture, men arrive at wrong conclusions. We are engaged in a mighty conflict and it will become more close and determined as we near the final struggle. We have a sleepless adversary and he is constantly at work upon human minds that have not had a personal experience in the teachings of the people of God for the past 50 years. Some will take the truth applicable to their time and place it in the future. Events in the train of prophecy that had their fulfillment away in the past are made future. And thus by these theories, the faith of some is undermined. Yeah, isn't it? Now let's read um, the next one that is found in, maybe you could read that as well, uh, pages 102 and 103. From the light that the Lord has been pleased to give me, you are in danger of doing the same work, presenting before others truths which have had their place and done their specific work for the time. In the history of the faith of people of God, you recognize these facts in Bible history as true, but apply them to the future. They have their force still in their proper place in the chain of events that have made us as people what we are today. And as such, they are to be presented to those who are in the darkness of error. Mm -hmm. Right counsel, right? I think that is applicable to all of us to be careful, right? Um, so this, this, she was shown in vision, so God took that very seriously. Now, where does Mrs. White place the trumpets in the flow of time? Does she make them future? Does she believe that they were past? We have clear evidence that Mrs. White believed that the sixth trumpet was fulfilled beginning 1844, which means that the first five trumpets must have been fulfilled 
before 1844, right? So we don't have to have the wisdom of Solomon or that of Einstein to understand that, okay? If you simply let God inspire you and the spirit of prophecy inspire you, then you will understand scripture clearly, right? Without bringing our own um, takes into the Bible. Let's let the, the spirit and scripture lead us. Now, Mrs. White and the time frame of the, uh, the, the trumpet. Now, now, what indications do we have in the writing of Mrs. White? that the trumpets have been fulfilled to a great degree with the exception of the fact that we are now in the period of the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet is totally in the future, right? The seventh trumpet is in the future. There are several indications in the writings of Mrs. White that she understood the trumpets within a historical framework, right? Um, let's take the expression time no longer in the sixth trumpet is in Revelation 10 in context of the sixth trumpet. Where does Mrs. White place that expression? Time shall be no longer. Does she present it as being past or future? Past from our time, right? Past from our time. So Mrs. White placed Revelation 10, a parenthesis within the sixth trumpet in the context of the event that occurred in 1844. So this is her time frame. Now notice this statement that we find in Selected Messages, say, uh, volume two, page 105. The book that was sealed was not the book of Revelation, but that portion of the prophecy of Daniel, which related to the last days. The scripture says, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. When the book was opened, the proclamation was made. Time shall be no longer. The book of Daniel is now unsealed. And the revelation made by, made by Christ to John is to come to all the inhabitants of the earth. By the increase of knowledge, a people is to be prepared to stand in the latter days. Mm, quite clear, no? Now, when they say knowledge has increased, I've heard many pastors saying that knowledge in the world has increased. But that is not what the Bible is saying. Knowledge of the sealed book of Daniel increases. We understand Daniel, the closed chapters, that is the 2,300-day prophecy. We understand it with the end time events. So the knowledge of that is what is increased, right? Not that knowledge increases and men are going, uh, going to the moon and all that. That is not but the Bible is talking about, right? So we get a little, we bring in a little bit of confusion into things. So Mrs. White places the, the, the time shall be no longer within uh, Revelation chapter 10, right? We will study Revelation chapter 10 in more detail as we go on. Now then notice this next statement that is also from Selected Messages, volume two, uh, pages 107 and 108. Once again, she's quoting Revelation 10 in context with the sixth trumpet. The message of Revelation 14, proclaiming that the hour of God's judgment has come, is given in the end of time, and, uh, and, and the angel of Revelation 10 is represented as having one foot on the sea and one foot on the land, showing that the message will be carried to distant lands. The oceans will be crossed and the islands of the sea will hear the proclamation of the last message of warning to our world. And the, and the angel which I saw sta stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven and, uh, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. This message announces the end of the prophetic periods. The disappointment of those who expected to see our Lord in 1844 was indeed bitter to those who had so ardently looked for his appearing. It was in the Lord's order 
that this disappointment should come and that hearts should be revealed. Okay, so Mrs. White is uh, put in its expression, time shall be no longer. Uh, during the time of the sixth trumpet, which began in 1844, right? So to take that time shall be no longer and put it into the future is not correct. It's not biblical, uh, scripturally authorized, right? It is not scripture. So it, it was something for us that happened in the past, right? Let's move on to the next one. This is about the seven thunders that are mentioned in Revelation 10. Uh, we have no time to talk about the seven thunders, but we will talk about them a little later in our series. But Mrs. White speaks about the seven thunders, which are also found in Revelation 10 in context with the sixth trumpet. Let's read um, Bible Commentaries, volume seven, page 971. The special light given to John, which was expressed in the seven thunders, was a delineation of events which would transpire under the first and second angel's messages. It was not best for the people to know these things, for their faith must necessarily be tested in the order of God. Most wonderful and advanced truths would be proclaimed. The first and second angel's messages were to be proclaimed, but no further light was to be revealed before these messages had done their specific work. This is represented by the angel standing with one foot on the sea, proclaiming with a most solemn oath that time shall be no longer. The time which the angel declares with a solemn oath is not the end of this world's history, neither of probationary time, but of prophetic time which should precede the advent of our Lord. That is, the people will not have another message upon definite time. After this period of time, reaching from 1842 to 1844, there can be no definite tracing of the prophetic time. The longest reckoning reaches to the autumn of 1844. Awesome, isn't it? So you cannot take uh, this uh, time shall be no more and put it to the end of the world, right? So before probation closes, because uh, that makes absolutely no sense, right? Now we're talking about this because uh, we, we have within the church this uh, dual um, interpretation, right? And then now also remember we had the Revelation chapter 10 talks about this bitter sweet experience, right? Which actually was in, co in context of the sixth trumpet, right? So you had bitter in the, um, sweet in the mouth and bitter in the belly. Now, Mrs. White understood the bitter experience of Revelation uh, 10, and she understood that it took place in 1844 in context with the sixth scene. Now let's read that statement. That is from Life Sketches, page 180. 189. The waiting people of God approached the hour when they fondly hoped their joys would be complete in the coming of the Savior. However, the time again passed unmarked by the ad advent of Jesus. Mortality still clung to us. The effects of the curse were all around us. It was hard to take up the vexing cares of life that we thought had been laid down forever. A bitter disappointment fell upon the little flock whose faith had been so strong and whose hope had been so high. But we were surprised that we felt so free in the Lord and were so strongly sustained by his strength and grace. So here she places it very, very, very firmly in the sixth trumpet. So you cannot take this and put it at, at the end of close of probation, right? It makes absolutely no sense, right? So the, the trumpets, if the, the trumpets cannot begin, you know, at the end of time. So I hope we are clear on this. The trumpets also have a historic sixth floor. They just, you just don't have them uh, and take the trumpets to literally happen at the end of time. It has no meaning. Now the <coughs> 1260 days and 42 months of Revelation 14, 
Once again, in the context of the sixth trumpet, Mrs. White understood that the papacy fulfilled the 1260 days and or 42 months of Revelation 11, right? That is the interlude between the sixth trumpet. She believed that these events uh, occurred between the years 538 and 1798 AD. She also understood that Revelation 11 describes the French Revolution and not Islam or Turkey, right? Uh, Revelation 11 is in context with the sixth seal. Now, like I said before, we found people like Ma Marvin Moore of Science of the Time uh, editor and others who believe that we must reapply these symbols of 42 months or 1260 days and reinterpret them in literal future time. That is, that, that is not biblical, right? Mrs. White, however, explicitly wrote that the 42 months covered the same period as the 1260 days, and that both periods apply to the papal supremacy during the Dark Ages. She also did a verse by verse analysis of Revelation 11 and interpreted it from a historicist perspective that is found in uh, the Bible and the French Revolution in Great Controversy, page 265 to. Uh, 288, right? Now let's read this statement from her, this particular statement that is found in the Great Controversy to, in, on page 266. So the period here mentioned 40 and 2 months and 1,203 score days are the same, alike representing the time in which the Church of Christ was to suffer oppression from Rome. The 1260 years of papal supremacy began in AD 538 and would therefore terminate in 1798. At that time, a French army entered Rome and made the Pope a prisoner, and he died in exile. Though a new Pope was soon afterward elected, the papal hierarchy has never since been able to wield the power which it before possessed. So once again, she places the 1260 days and uh, 42 months at the same time period, three, 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 uh, but three, three and a half, you know, times as the same period, right? She, does, she doesn't apply it to the end of time as literal time, like some of the Adventist talk, right? Then we find again that in um, Red Controversy, page 439, she continues to be more explicit in this particular quotation. Let's read that and see as well. Power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. And says the prophet, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. Again, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. The 40 and 2 months are the same as the time and times in the dividing of time, three years and a half or 1260 days of Daniel 7, the time during which the papal power was to oppress God's people. This period is stated in preceding chapters, be began Sorry, this period, as stated in preceding chapters, began with the supremacy of the papacy in AD 538 and terminated in 1798. At that time, the Pope was made captive by the French army. The papal power received its deadly wound, and the prediction was fulfilled. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. So if you read Spirit of Prophecy and the Bible together, you find that it's pretty clear. So these schools of thought within Adventism of having dual fulfillment is actually not uh, Bible authorized or Spirit of Prophecy authorized, right? Now, the final one is measuring the temple, that final one we do today, where she talks about applied the measuring of the temple, that is once again the interlude of uh, the sixth trumpet to 1844. That measuring of the temple is actually uh, talks about the judgment, right? So the measuring of temple, which is uh, Revelation uh, in 11 verse 14, which again is in context uh, of the sixth trumpet. And she once again applies it to, the, to what began in 
1844. So let's read um, Bible Commentaries, Volume 6, page 972, and see her, her explanation to, to that as well, the measuring of the temple. Measuring the temple. The grand judgment is taking place and has been going on for some time. Now the Lord says, measure the temple and the worshippers thereof. Remember, when you are walking the streets about your business, God is measuring you. When you are attending your household duties, when you engage in conversation, God is measuring you. Remember that your words and actions are being daguerreotyped, basically photographed in the books of heaven. As the artist on the polished plate reproduces the face, here is the work going on, measuring the temple and its worshippers to see who will stand in the last day. Those who stand fast shall have an abundant entrance into the kingdom. Where do I say? Of our Lord Jesus. Yeah. Into the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When we are doing our work, remember there is one that is watching the spirit in which we are doing it. Shall we not bring the Savior into our everyday lives, into our secular work and domestic duties? Then in the name of God, we want to leave behind everything that is not necessary. All gossiping or unprofitable visiting and present ourselves as servants of the living God. Frightening, isn't that? <laughs> Very powerful. <laughs> Very powerful. So when it says measure the temple, it is something that is going to happen, not in the future. It is something that began in 1844 and it's continuing today, even in our day, right? So, so I hope you understood that we were able to clear the doubts uh, which uh, the, in, in, our, in our church itself has these different schools of uh, thought in interpreting the Bible, but the main, th main non-negotiable uh, stand that the Adventist church as a whole takes is that we use the historicist method to interpret prophecy, right? So that is clear. So then the trumpets also have a starting point which was in uh, when Christ uh, entered on Pentecost, and it and it flows through the Christian era in into the time of his second coming, right? So today you and I are still in the period of the sixth trumpet. Now next week we are going to look at the relationship between the seals and the trumpet. Since we just finished the series on the seals, we'll be able to understand it much better. So we are going to see how important that is as it relates to the seven trumpets. How the, um, uh, I, I have done a, what should I say, a infographic of the churches and the seals and the trumpets and how they flow during the same period of time, but they are different events, right? Starting from the apostolic time. So we will discuss that next week uh, in our next study.